And now uh, we continue our track uh, with a, a topic that a lot of people talk about, which is, uh, let's say, contract-driven development or collaboration-driven development. How to decide? Can we do both? Right? So, uh, and we have a, uh, a speaker for, from Smartbird, uh, Aliana Inzana, who is Senior Director and uh, of Product Management, will talk about it uh, to us. So we're really glad to have her. And yes, hello, Aliana. Uh, hello, how are you asking, doing? <laughs> yeah, I'm doing well, doing well. Just asking you to share your screen, mm -hmm. uh, which is the main challenge of uh, digital conferences. And, uh, and after that, we'll be able to listen to your talk. All right, let's see if we can get the screen sharing going. That works. We see your screen. We hear you. The stage is yours for 25 minutes. Thank you, Aliana. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Maddie. Um, and, and welcome, everyone, to uh, our talk. You'll forgive me the sort of, um, you know, uh, a dad joke, I guess you could say, of the title. Um, I did, in fact, come up with it on American Father's Day. Um, so today we're going to talk about, in the API space, a lot of the conversation around contract-driven development has centered on the question, did we build the API right? But by using the contract as a foundation for our common understanding of the API, we can answer not only that question, but the equally important and uh, ever so much more elusive, did we build the right API? So in today's talk, we'll be discussing how API specifications and consumer-driven contracts can form the basis of cross-team collaboration in delivering quality services. Now, we have limited time together, right? So I'm not going to be delving into other techniques to build the right API from the get-go, like event storming or behavior-driven development. Job theory, these are all part of the process. But as a product manager, I can tell you that there's a fairly decent chance you use one, even all of these techniques, and without the right user acceptance testing, when the API is out there in production, it may not actually meet the needs of its users. So I want you to think back the last time that you created a new API. Now, assuming you followed design first principles, it's likely that the exercise started with perhaps some devs, an architect, maybe an expert or two, and a whiteboard. This is going back a few months now. So you have to sort of hope the experts understand enough about APIs, that the architects and the engineers, they get the domain, that the whiteboard has markers that works, that someone can find that one eraser that's the only eraser that's on the floor for all of those conference rooms. And then someone, let's say it's the architect, they go, they take a picture of the whiteboard for all of us to delete later and goes back to her desk and creates a specification. From this point, there are a myriad of ways that this exercise can go pear-shaped. We have experienced probably a few of them. To consider all of them, well, this could be a week-long course. So to focus in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to pick some of my favorite ways that design first can go off the rails and how to make your contracts the focus of collaboration to bring you back again. So let's start with the first obvious challenge. You aren't practicing design first. Perhaps there are legacy services, or maybe you're in that first uncomfortable leg of the design first journey, where you're taking stock of the code first APIs around you and wondering if the generated documentation is even worth evaluating. Yes, it, it will be, at least. In the transition from code first to design first, the contract, however it's generated, is a bridging solution. The initial foray could be centralizing contract management or adoption of the contract as a source of truth not only for API discovery and documentation, but for testing and for validation of the API in the DevOps process. And whether or not the contract is considered a build artifact or a design artifact, in the ultimate analysis, whether code or design first principles were in play, the API was created in recognition of a need. The next challenge is a little more abstract. See, design first is not exactly contract first, not if you consider that initial sketch of the specification as an immutable contract between the provider and its consumers. For design first to be effective, to deliver on its promise, design must predate and inform the specification. So with the pictures from your whiteboard, you return to your desk, you write up the specification. Now we have a specification, um, maybe some business requirements, 
what's next? Do you just build it? If we were architecting houses instead of services, then we would hope the architect knows how to formulate an executable blueprint. And I would absolutely agree that it is important for the builders, the construction engineers, to follow those plans on where the pipes go or which of those things is a, is a load bearing wall. These can all be correct and built to spec and still not work for the people for whom you're building. The same is true of services. If you don't use that specification as a foundation for collaboration, if you don't arrive at that communal understanding of what the API does and how it does it, it's just like executing on a blueprint without considering how the building will be used. Again, the means to solicit feedback from this broader community lies at the intersection of tools and the specification. Through the specs duality of machine and human readableness, you don't have to ask for comments on some gnarly looking back of the napkin specification, but rather using API mocking or virtualization, you can create from the spec a living example of your API. Users, partners, documentation writers, they could all interact with your API before a single line of code is written and give you feedback. And the best news about this is that because that feedback came early enough in the process, you'll actually incorporate it into the specification and then ultimately the code. Keeping design in design first requires engaged listening to your consumers, not always to what they ask you for, but to what they do in your API sandbox. And with a holistic look at design from engineers, subject matter experts, SREs, security partners, you name it, there is a far greater chance of building the right API by virtue of the lightning fast design revs that are enabled by specifications. For the majority of APIs, this kind of collaboration is not a one-time thing. It occurs over time and it involves a seriously non-trivial number of people. So you code the API and as a step, maybe it's the final step, the API build is run against a spec for conformance, but that testing is more like um, a one-time check. It's not an ongoing process. So what happens when it's time to evolve the API? You have to iterate. And it has been known to occasionally happen that subsequent revisions, the API build falls out of conformance with the specification. And this can be a real problem. So again, imagine you're an architect, uh, the kind that builds houses this time, and you never check to see if the house that the crew was building aligned to your blueprint. What could the impact be if then you plan an addition to the structure without knowing that the construction engineers moved the load bearing wall? The consequences could be disastrous, but minimally, time will be wasted and there will be rework. Instead of performing manual checks of endpoints and comparing them against documentation, or even running a one-time test between the build and the contract, because specifications are designed to be machine readable, it's relatively straightforward to automate producer-side contract tests and add them directly into your build pipelines. So now every pull request can trigger a, contact, a, a contract test. And builds that are out of conformance with the specification, they won't be promoted into production. If style guides and rules have been incorporated into your design system, and then obviously followed in the design, then the contract test can also confirm that governance was followed. Consumers of the API benefit because no one really enjoys working with poorly documented or wholly inaccurate APIs. And the specification can be treated like another piece of code. So similar workflows can be established with a version control system. So contract-driven development from this angle looks a lot like test-driven development more broadly. A producer side contract describes how functionality uh, will be added to the API. When that change of the spec causes the build pipeline tests to flip red, the engineering team is alerted to pick up the new work. By executing on new code, they then flip those contract tests back to green. But the added benefit of integrating such tests into your CI/CD pipeline is the better alignment of your dev organization. 
Lag time between committing a change to the spec and engineering picking up that work is shortened. And no matter who's initiating the PR, alignment between documentation and build can be confirmed. You know you're building the API right. Maintaining the connection between the spec and live service is an important aspect of evolving your API. But the producer side contract test can also alert teams when there's disengagement on API collaboration, right? Because a failure downstream happens when designers and developers are not in agreement about how the API should behave. So though the main purpose I would argue is to know that you built the API right, contract tests can also provide an early warning system for when the API may have veered from the path of building the right API because at that point, the specification is no longer a good foundation for describing what you're going to do next. So now let's meet your other contracts and talk a little bit about consumer-driven contract testing. So far, we focused on things that are within our control as API providers. Now we are going into the unknown and discussing the whole point of providing APIs, consumers. Whether they're internal to our organizations or basically anyone on the internet who knows how to call a public API, consumers are both the intended target of your API's content and also one of the chief reasons that design first is so darn hard to maintain sometimes. Consumers make our lives difficult in a number of ways. First of all, they use your APIs and they use them in ways they largely do not share with you. Even the best telemetry can't tell you all that they do or use within the API. Transactions can occur outside of the observed window, for example, and those won't be documented. Consumers cause security problems. I mean, like that API, it doesn't just hack itself. In certain architectural patterns, event-driven or messaging for one, they can be entirely anonymous and unknown to you, that is until you change something. And then they'll make themselves heard with rollback requests, hot fixes, y'all know the drill. They use your API wrong, even after all that beautiful documentation too. If there's an endpoint out there, they're consuming it, even if it's that one endpoint you maybe should have deprecated from the crazy monolithic data model that you theoretically were gonna neaten when you moved it into microservices. But hey, you know what, Cons human beings, essentially conservative, and you know, you might've needed it. You can have the world's most well-designed API with brilliant interactive and polished documentation, but as an API producer, you can only know your world and the content you create. You cannot know the hearts, the minds, and the implementation details of your consumers without a contract. The consumer-driven contract test is another way to answer, did you build the API right? Only this time, the API provider is not the one asking that question. A consumer-driven contract is a sort of formalized request that you stop breaking someone else's stuff. And even for internal APIs, your audience can be considerable. Picture for a moment, the absolute rabbit's warren of microservices that your organization is required to maintain. And they keep multiplying until your service architecture diagram vaguely resembles the Death Star. Oh, wait, not this one, this one. Much scarier, isn't it? There isn't just one consumer, but in certain cases, the extent of your API's audience can be known, particularly in a microservices architecture and internal APIs. <clears throat> now, please multiply all those consumers by the ridiculous number of ways you can potentially break something. Because there's just so many ways of breaking stuff, the provider-based spec contract tests don't cover all the ways you can break an integration especially in the implementation details outside of the spec. 
you could change the structure of a response, for example, um, or change an object's properties. What if you added a description to the movie object? It could increase the payload size of a call for movies by quite a lot. Then there's error handling. Again, depending on how a consumer has implemented their business logic, producing an error um, could be, or altering the error type, or even the error message, depending on what they've done, that could be a breaking change. There's the event type and, and the event payload. So changing an event type and an event-driven version of messaging, um, it, it's sort of like messing with the, the REST resource. Consumers will need to listen for the new type, and if they don't know about that, they're gonna miss events. The event payload, very similar to changing the structure of a REST response, consumers implement all sorts of validation and also routing based on event payloads. Therefore, even additive changes have the potential for breaking. Rate limiting. Um, the way that the customer is invoking your service may need to change because you've decided to, to rate limit. Um, worst case scenario, you know, maybe they'll even have to pay you for the service or upgrade their subscription. And then content distribution, like um, <clears throat> moving the API behind a CDN. Then uh, trying to figure out, where did those new headers come from? I can actually give you an example from uh, a customer of ours. They were using SmartBear's uh, API virtualization tool uh, to record an existing service, and then they were asserting against the responses from that service. And they couldn't figure out where these new headers were coming from, and it never had been a problem before. They thought it was our recorder, so they called customer care, but we couldn't replicate the issue. It turns out they didn't know, the, the whole team didn't know, but their, their ops team had actually moved their API behind a CDN, and the added headers, which were actually bumping out the header that our client was looking for to do routing, was part of the CDN's geographic routing. This all goes to say, that if you wait until your API is in production or you're doing a final pass of tests before deployment, it's entirely likely that you've waited a little bit too long. So instead of testing against the deployment candidate, a good method is to create a virtual service and then run those consumer-driven contract tests against the mock and incorporate the feedback into your design cycle. There's an additional plus, and it's one that not a lot of folks talk about, but if you know that the consumers of your API are providing up-to-date contract tests that are comprehensive, and that those test assets are managed centrally in your version control system, so you're not falling behind, then it could be possible to further simplify your API by deleting unused endpoints. SmartBear did a customer survey, survey, and one of the jobs to be done where users had the absolute most difficulty was knowing when part or even all of an API could be sunset. So the contract-driven tests can assist us there too. In closing, the act of designing should really be an ongoing collaboration, which is facilitated by the specification as teams iterate. The specification can bridge code and design first approaches. You can use the spec to perform user acceptance testing before you even write a line of code. If you keep design in design first, so that it's not design first only at first, by integrating the uh, producer driven contract tests into your build pipelines, and if you use the consumer-driven contract as a means of understanding the impact of any change, by using these tools, you can be more confident that you have both built the API right and also built the right API. Thank you very much, Elena. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have a we have some minutes for questions. Uh, um, one question about like, it seems we can handle a lot of the life cycle through uh, through the specs. Mm -hmm. What, in your opinion, what should stay out of it? Right. What should stay out of it? Should stay out of the spec or should stay out of the conversation? 
Uh, <laughs> no, no. What, no, what should stay out of the spec? What's the human processes mm -hmm. that can be still out of the spec and, and still be relevant uh, you know, uh, to support contract-driven development? Absolutely. So I think one of the biggest challenges of, of engin any engineering organization, honestly, is to overcome those barriers of communication that are inherent throughout all our organizations. What I think is interesting, when you have centralized tools and centralized content like specifications or uh, a version control system for your code, it's not a, it's not a fix everything, but what it does is it allows for the means of collaboration. It's same like having a Slack group allows a group to communicate a lot easier than they would if they were all uh, dispersed around various offices and, and using email. Um, so I think in terms of what the specifications currently cover, um, I think it is important that implementation details are optional. Um, you can see this kind of in uh, the async API world. Um, I have always been a very big fan of knowing as a testing vendor, like, all right, well, what method are you using for back pressure on that API? And, you know, I think uh, Fran, it's pretty standard argument to me is like, that, that is an implementation detail. I'm like, all right, but specs are also extendable. And so you could have a vendor extension to a spec that allows you to document something which is important for your organization, but may not necessarily be something that is broadly accepted as part of a specification. Yeah, we have a question from Jason McDonald. How do, how do the consumer-driven contract come into existence? Do consumers write them? Do producers build them for monitoring? Yeah, if you can remind uh, this part uh, for Jason. Sure. So the answer is actually can be both. Um, when you're creating sort of the functional performance and other types of tests for your API, you can kind of fake a consumer. So that's one way of going about it. Um, but the thing that we're seeing in some larger organizations, and, and quite frankly, I think it's a practice we'd like to foster, is when you have people who are sort of, they're trying to isolate their own microservice, let's say. Um, they're building tests that sort of validate that your microservice is actually behaving perfectly, um, and they are testing their system. If you do that, you're actually creating a test asset that could be shared more broadly. And if it is shared more broadly, and if you accept that this test validates that your microservice is working, even with its dependencies, then those dependencies can kind of pick up the test asset and say, all right, well, now we can use it too. So again, it's about how the ecosystem enables that collaboration. Yep. Yeah. Uh, last question, maybe about like the uh, how to onboard the business into uh, collaborating to the specs, like uh, work. Yeah, you yeah, very gently, very carefully. <laughs> um, you know, I I think the the best examples sometimes come out of the transitions from code first to design first. Um, it, it's it's a it's a change. It's a way of life change. And I think one of the best ways of going about doing that is when you're having conversations in the abstract. It's very hard to pinpoint a source of, let's say, unease, right? If you're trying to decide what to do. When you have something to react to, uh, particularly something that could be interactive, right? It's much easier to say, oh, I get that, that does this. You know, words can be interpreted in different ways, but when you're interacting with a physical thing, you know what the intention was. And knowing intention is a great way of kind of driving that collaborative cycle because understanding it means you can give good feedback, feedback that's actionable. Having feedback that's actionable then is, is sort of drives that quality story all the way around. Yeah, thank you, Alina. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it was really insightful and uh, and also the artwork was quite nice. And I think a lot of people can take uh, a lot of good advice from, uh, from this about how they can collaborate while doing contract-driven development. I think it's extremely important. So uh, yeah, and if you want to know more about like uh, contract-driven development and about testing, uh, SmartBear ha have a, um, has a booth at the event in the expo, so you can go there and ask some questions.